to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I would rather die than eat broccoli. I would rather die than give up my integrity. I would rather die than live enslaved. I would rather lose all my worldly possessions than lose my child. I would give up an arm in order to save my child or my spouse. I would give up my life rather than lose my faith. These phrases can be used as an, as an oath that is very serious. Or, as with my first example, you can use that as hyperbolic humor. We've all heard sentences like that, either spoken seriously or spoken in humor in a lot of movies. They have actors that will use that as a, as a means of humor because it highlights something that you're going to say that's very serious and then used against something not that important. Well, often we have, well, we have similar statements in Mark chapter 9 that seem like they fall into the same category. And often when we read those, we think that what Jesus is saying here is like one of these phrases. And it's similar to the serious oath of the I would rathers, but not exactly the same. You see, in our reading, this statement from Jesus carries with it a unique layer of challenge that those statements don't contain, and a unique layer of Christian joy that comes with this serious message from Jesus that our normal human expressions lack. So let's dig into the text. So the setting for this text is the same setting we had last week, where Jesus is talking to his disciples essentially about what it means to be his disciples. Last week, they were arguing about greatness, and Jesus set the record straight on how he views that. And right now, at the beginning of our setting for the gospel reading, he's still sitting there with this child that he's grabbed and put in the midst of his disciples because he was teaching them about status. They were thinking of greatness in terms of status, and in the ancient world... Children had no status. They were not valued and prized like children are today in our society. And in many cases, many of them died very young. Some research indicates as much as 60% of children died before the age of 16 at this time. Children were sort of the forgotten members of society. They had no status, no strength, and no say. And Jesus teaches his disciples that this is what greatness looks like. Those who receive those of no status as if they were receiving Christ. Well, this teaching continues in our reading today. Because then the disciples bring up the example of, Hey, Jesus, there's this guy that we don't know who is casting out demons in your name. And we want to stop him. And again, we get to the question of status, right? In our Old Testament reading, Joshua, son of Nun, says something similar to Moses about the men prophesying in the camp. And Moses says, are you jealous for my sake? Now, the disciples are jealous for their own sake because they don't know this guy, never mind that he's doing something that is actually in line with the ministry of Jesus, but Jesus doesn't so much focus on the man that they're referring to, but he's, he's teaching his disciples something important. He's telling them what they ought to focus on and where the real threat lies. You see, the disciples are convinced that there's a problem that this guy is doing this stuff because he's unaffiliated with them. And they think that's the problem. And Jesus' answer to their question about him is almost one that really doesn't show a lot of concern because he wants to redirect them to where the real threat lies. So the first lesson of our text today is that the real threat comes from within and not from others. 
You see, Jesus' response about this question regarding the man casting out demons is quick and to the point and pretty unconcerned. He says, don't stop him. There isn't somebody who can do mighty works in my name who will very soon after be able to work against me. And he says, the one who isn't against us is for us. Jesus' response indicates that this isn't of much concern to him because he's doing the things that Jesus' ministry is calling others to do. And it really isn't an issue that he isn't associated with the twelve. And he wants them to focus on something else. And that's where we get to this section of passages that are often hard to understand because Jesus speaks with such harsh language and severity. But he's driving the point home for his disciples and those who would follow him, which includes you and me, where the real problem is and what we really need to watch out for. And this is where we get to those phrases that sound a little bit like the I would rather die than X. I would rather lose my arm or my leg than suffer Y. And that's the second lesson of our text for today is that the threat is serious, deadly serious. How serious, you might ask, as you read these words in Mark chapter 9. You might also ask yourself, does Jesus really mean what he says? Well, think about when we say those phrases, I would rather die than eat broccoli. Do we really mean that? Of course not. If the situation were to come about where those were your only two choices, I can't think of a single person who would choose death over eating some broccoli. But when you say that, that I would rather die than lose my faith, or that I would rather lose my arm than my child, do you mean that? I think the answer is yes. Of course, we hope that that situation never occurs, but in our hierarchy of value, an arm is far less than a child, and our earthly life is far less than our faith. So I think the answer here to the question, does Jesus really mean what he says, is yes, he does. He really does mean that if the choice is going to hell or losing a hand, you lose the hand. Because what we're talking about here isn't some slap on the wrist. We're talking about the end of days, the final judgment of God. And he says in a couple of places in this reading The nature of that judgment is eternal. In verse 40, he says, to the unquenchable fire. And then he says, at the end of this whole section, be thrown into hell where their their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. In other words, the penalty is forever. So then we can reframe these statements more in language that we might understand. Would you rather spend an eternity in unquenchable fire, in suffering forever, or lose a hand, or a leg, or an eye? That's what Jesus is saying here. So I think we would agree, as people of faith, That a hand to avoid that fate is not too great a price. So Jesus really means what he says here. But then the question that follows up from that is, all right, pastor, I get it, he's serious, but are we really going to do that? Is that really what he's asking us to do? To which I would respond, well, do you see a lot of one-eyed, one-armed, one-legged Christians around? No. So why is that, that Jesus really means all of these serious and severe words about the threat of sin that exists within each of us, and yet people aren't chopping off their hands and legs or tearing out their eyes? Sin is serious. This is the message of Jesus. But why does Jesus give us demands here that we can't fulfill? I mean, think about it for a moment. Maybe as a kid you 
you know, you didn't really steal anything major, but maybe you stole a Snickers bar. And maybe it wasn't from a convenience store. Maybe it was just from your brother or your parents. Is Jesus saying that we should chop your hand off because you did that? Or if you looked at something you weren't supposed to look at, even if it was an accident, that temptation, that sin is still there. Should your eye be torn out because of it? The third lesson of the text is this. We perish without His grace. This isn't the first time in the Bible, nor is it the last time, that Jesus demands things of us that we can't do. Things that we can't fulfill. A few examples that come to mind is the story of the rich man who approaches Jesus and says, What must I do to be saved? And he thinks he keeps the law perfectly. And so Jesus tells him the very thing he knows he won't do. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Flee from all forms of sexual immorality. Pray continually. If you are going to follow me, you must first hate your father and your mother. Give up your life. Take up your cross and follow me. And the list goes on and on. Why does Jesus do this? Why does he make demands of us that we can't fulfill? Why is Jesus saying this here when he knows that we're not going to do it? Jesus is saying this because the threat that faces each one of us as it faced the 12 disciples he's addressing is so serious, we are hopeless before it. Imagine if we actually took this literally and did it. Do you think that would save us from the threat of sin? We'd have nothing of our own bodies left at the end and we'd still be stuck with a sinful heart. Because the threat doesn't come from out there, but it comes from within. So is it cruel of Jesus to burst our delusions that we think we can deal with this by ourselves? Or is it part of his great act of mercy that he came here to do? This is where we get to the unique layer of challenge. The unique layer of challenge in these that isn't present in our normal earthly expressions is that it is an impossible thing to do. It's not going to be done. And even if we do it, we are still doomed by this threat of sin. But this is also where we get to the unique layer of joy. Because Jesus knows this about you and he knows it about me. And he doesn't use this language to drive us to hopelessness and despair. He uses this language to refocus us, just like his disciples. He refocuses us away from our thinking that we can do this on our own. He refocuses us away from downplaying the seriousness or severity of our sins in order to rationalize that we're a sort of good person. He does this to burst apart and refocus us on Him. He is the source of mercy. He is the thing, the person, the Savior who will defeat this threat. So this is where He begins to refocus us on the gift of His salvation. Because our eyes and our hands and our feet, they cause us to stumble. We do fall prey to the sins of flesh, the sins of desire, and all manner of temptation. And it is serious. The real consequence of that is eternal death in hell. Jesus isn't pulling any punches. Because he wants you to know what he's here to do. He doesn't stumble. He doesn't give in to any of those temptations, despite being fully man. 
So that when he goes to the cross and takes your sin and my sin, all of this stumbling upon himself, what he gives us in exchange is his perfection, his righteousness, and life eternal. You know, it's really fascinating when you start to look up the research that's being done on whether or not Christians believe in the devil and hell. And the numbers are sort of depressing. About 58% of Christians don't believe hell is a real place. Or rather, that's, sorry, 58% believe hell is a real place. So the remaining 42% don't. And it's even worse for the devil. Only about a quarter of American Christians believe that the devil is actually real. Most believe he's a symbol for evil. And so I don't doubt the need that Jesus feels to speak with such strong language here to remind us of the very real threat of sin. But he has a twofold purpose. One is to drive us to hopelessness within ourselves. To no longer look to ourselves for the solution, for the ability to deal with this threat. And the second reason is to get us to focus on him and the gift of the gospel. I mean, you and I admit this as much when we do it in our confession. It wasn't in there today, but there's a phrase in one of our common confessions that says that we deserve his temporal and eternal punishment. That's our acknowledgement that we understand that the price of our sin is serious. But that's in the middle for a reason. It ends with an appeal to mercy from God, and his answer for that appeal is Jesus. Jesus has dealt with the threat. And so that's why he ends the imagery of our reading today with salt. Saltiness, how do we keep ourselves salty? A lot of times we think it's by doing good. And once again, then we'd be refocusing on ourselves and our ability to make things as we wish. When rather to be salty means that our faith is in Jesus. Salt can be used in two main ways as something that purges rot and unwanted things in cleaning and also an additive that enhances flavor. So whether it's the additive that enhances flavor or preserves or the, purge, the purging effect of salt, in this imagery that Jesus gives us, it's good news for us in both ways. That our sin is being purged from us and that now we are at peace. And we can withstand that purging because our foundation is not in ourselves and in our doing or the doings of others, but in the work of Jesus. So despite the seriousness of this threat, a threat that doesn't come from others but comes from within each one of us, and the seriousness of its consequences, Jesus ends this teaching on a positive note by saying that they should have salt in themselves, be at peace with one another. The only thing that brings peace in our grave situation is faith in Jesus. Faith that he did what we could not and kept the law. He never stumbled. Faith in doing so that he gave us his life and faith that we now have nothing to fear from sin, from Satan, and from hell because that's no longer where we're going. That is no longer our fate. For we have life in Jesus. A life that is forever. So be at peace, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, for you are salty because you have faith. And you have life forever in Jesus. In his name, amen. May the peace of